Early in the 20th century, the bustling city of New Orleans stood as a beacon of prosperity and excitement, drawing people from all corners of the globe. Along with its fertile economy, the city also gave birth to a thriving cultural landscape. With the vibrant notes of jazz filling the air and eclectic mix of residents contributing to its colorful atmosphere. But beneath the glitz and glamour, a darker side lurked within the city's shadows, a chilling tale of terror that seemed to defy our very reality, but yet would strike fear into the hearts of those who had heard it. Now, as dusk descended upon the city one fateful evening in 1932, a police officer patrolling Royal Street found himself startled by an unusual sight. A young girl in her 20s, appearing frail and disoriented, walked aimlessly down the street, her wrist bearing the marks of deep cuts that still were oozing with fresh blood. Now, the concerned officer approached the girl, intent on offering her assistance and uncovering the source of her distress. But he listened with growing unease as the girl recounted her harrowing experience. She claimed to have been held captive by two men who sought refuge in the shadows of the city's darkest corners. The girl described the horrifying ordeal that she and several others had endured, having been mercilessly shackled and their wrists sliced open. Her captors had underestimated her willpower and resourcefulness, for she found an opportune moment to free herself and free from her clutches. But for her, the nightmare was pretty far from over. But the danger remained for others still imprisoned by these sickos. And understandably so, the officer was very skeptical of such a ridiculous story. But as this officer was looking into her eyes and seeing how genuine her account was, not to mention she was pretty physically battered, he knew something horrid had occurred, but just wait because the twist is going to blow you away. Now, with a deep sense of duty, he called in backup and ventured into the dwelling in question. The girl insisted that others might still be in danger and that he couldn't ignore the possibility. The officers followed her to a house on the corner of Royal and St. Anne in the vibrant French Quarter. The residents belonged to two rather unassuming dock workers, John and Wayne Carter, who were known as mild-mannered men who kept to themselves hardly the monstrous culprits she described, but they have a nasty, dark secret that I'm just about to unveil, so hold on. Now, when they arrived at the quiet home, there was no response to the knocks on the door. Fearing the worst, the police cautiously entered the dark abode, flashlights piercing the shadows, and what they discovered within would haunt their dreams. The smell alone was a warning, though it could not prepare the officers for the nightmarish scene they would find. Four people were tied to chairs, their wrists slashed, still bleeding profusely, each one a reflection of the girl's own condition. It was apparent that some effort had been made to treat their wounds, but it was a cruel mockery of care. One was barely clinging to life in desperate need of immediate medical attention. Now, surrounding the captives were bloody cups, as if the macabre residue of a twisted dinner party. The blood was still fresh. The captors must have sipped it from the cups, just as the girl had claimed. Now, these horrifying details made it clear that the stories held far more truth than what was comfortable. As if the grotesque scene was not enough, the officers stumbled upon another room, a chamber of horrors, where 15 more people lie with their wrists slashed and bloodied. Some still clung to life, suffering in silence, while the others were hidden beneath stained sheets, long past saving. You could imagine the odor and a cacophony of flies buzzing nearby with the dark, dank, and humid conditions drawn to the sickly sweet scent of death. And yet the Carter brothers, the orchestrators, were nowhere to be found. Resolving to capture the fiendish duo, the officers devised an ambush. Ten of New Orleans' finest people gathered within the house, preparing to bring an end to the horror perpetrated by these seemingly normal men. In that dreadful house, the officers lay in wait, fueled by a desire for justice. Unbeknownst to them, this was just the beginning of a tale that would forever tear at the fabric of New Orleans. 
Now, the story goes that the police eventually found the Carter brothers, but spoke about how such small men possessed unnatural strength and power for their size. Because as the sun dipped behind the horizon and the city was now blanketed in darkness, locals could hear the chaos unfolding on that fateful evening. When the police had cornered the Carter brothers, these seemingly unassuming men put up a fierce battle. Despite standing just around five feet, six inches tall and weighing under 160, they easily took on the might of 10 burly big police officers, tossing them around like toys and even dispatching a few of their opponents into unconsciousness. Some even say that the brothers successfully fought off the officers before performing a supernatural leap from a balcony and escaping into the shadows of the night like feral beasts. Regardless of the varying details, the Carter brothers were eventually captured and promptly confessed to a vicious and unbelievable truth. Now, here we go. This is the twist. They claim they were apparently immortal vampires with an insatiable hunger for blood. The brothers even coldly informed their captors that they could only be killed by fire or decapitation, suggesting that the police must execute such forms of justice or else face the brothers' relentless killing spree in their quest for blood. In the end, they were tried, found guilty of murder, and hanged. Now, it seemed that the hangman's noose was just as effective as fire and decapitation in bringing down these so-called vampires. However, the story doesn't necessarily end with their deaths. Terrified now by the rumors of vampires in their midst, the horrified locals demanded the two bodies be exhumed. And to the shock and disbelief of everyone around, the coffins were found empty prompting fears that the brothers had somehow survived and escaped to hunt once more. Now, the dark legend of the Carter brothers festers like an open wound in New Orleans still. Whispers persisted that two of their surviving victims spiraled into madness and became serial killers themselves. One of them, known as, known as Felipe, claimed the lives of 32 people before vanishing without a trace, leaving behind a diary recounting dreams and fantasies of blood. Now, another unnamed victim laid waste to hundreds of lives in a deranged killing spree. Other victims were not driven to murder, but madness took hold of them just the same, and they spent the rest of their lives confined to asylums. Now, as the years passed and the city began to grow, sightings of the Carter brothers continue to happen. But to this day in the modern age, as the shadows lengthen and our twilight descends, old fears do resurface and people do still nervously glance over their shoulders, wondering if they might be next to encounter the immortal vampires that once wreaked havoc upon New Orleans. Now, the tale of two brothers, John and Wayne Carter, who were accused of being modern day vampires, killing victims and drinking their blood, does have its holes. I mean, this chilling story from the 1930s sounds like from something straight out of a horror novel, but is it really true or simply an internet fabrication? I mean, some elements of the story are just too good to be ignored, like the chilling account of how the brothers were supposedly discovered surrounded by the drained bodies of their victims. But there are many problematic aspects. I mean, for starters, it's difficult to verify whether the Carter brothers ever actually existed. I mean, there are no details about where they were buried or their full names of their so-called victims. Now, additionally, in-depth research was actually conducted by a Courtney Maroc, yielded no evidence of this story ever appearing in newspapers from that era. Maroc shared her findings, saying she could not find any official executions of John and Wayne Carter and that the story seemed to be entirely fabricated. I pressed on with my research. Papers love sensational, weird, and wild stories stories, regardless of the decade. I gave it the benefit of a doubt and thought about how to research it from another angle. I even checked deathpenaltyusa.org. No men named Carter were executed from 1911 to 1932 either. Moreover, considering the supernatural elements of the story, Marat concluded that not only did these events probably never happen, but it's also likely that the story itself had stemmed from a simple internet urban legend. 
So is this a story of real modern day vampires in New Orleans or just a tall tale spinning from the depths of the internet? Is there really any truth to this horrifying account? Well, to this day, there's been nothing definitive to prove it either false or true. And so the case does remain unsolved to this day. Hey guys, before we move on to the next story, I just wanted to say that if you want a chance to come hang out with me in person and see a roster of many other great researchers and hosts, you guys should come to get tickets to come and see the Paranormal Roundtable's second annual Dogman slash Cryptid Conference. It will be located in Fort Worth, Texas, and is taking place around September 2nd to the 3rd. Many of the greats will be there, including but not limited to Josh Turner, Barton Nunnally, Ken Gearhart, and a bunch of other amazing people. So if you want to get tickets, you can go ahead and get them in the description below. Let's get back to the show. This story comes from Edmund, who Edmund and his brother were returning from a late night jazz gig in the heart of New Orleans. And as they're making their way back to their old family's plantation house nestled in the outskirts, Edmund noted that even though the humidity was stifling and the air was heavy and still, he felt different as if the world around him was holding its breath. Now, this isn't quite normal because these two brothers would go out on the town a lot and do a lot of things together. And he went out of his way to describe just how out of place he felt this night. Now, they also took a different road home, a winding one that cut through a dense, portion of swamp and then climbing a slight incline to a clearing where an old sugarcane field would lay, now overgrown and wild. And so to the left, the swamp would continue and a wall of cypress trees and Spanish moss lay. Now, even though Edmund at the time was in his early 30s and he was a pretty hard skeptic by nature, even though the entirety of New Orleans and the surrounding area is steeped in all sorts of lore from black magic, occultism, voodoo, and just cryptid in the paranormal normal, he still didn't really believe, but he was unprepared for the spectacle that was about to unfold. Because as he's looking over, he sees something moving around from the depths of the swamp, a figure emerging. Initially, he thought it was a man and was wondering why a guy would be out here in the middle of the night in the swamps crossing the road, when pretty soon he realized that the figure was not a man at all, but something else, and that it was heading towards the road from the cypress grove. It was actually suspended in the air about a good eight to 10 feet off the ground. And he mentions how this sight was uncanny, like watching a man vault off a diving board, arms extended forward, legs bent at the knees. It, whatever it was, was upright, its body covered in a coat of hair. He knew it wasn't an alligator, it wasn't a bear, it was something else entirely. Edmund and his brother both froze as they witnessed this grotesque blend of human and beast with what he mentions was a long snout and pointed ears and his brother later compared it to that of an ancient Egyptian god, Anubis. But what was strange about his sighting is that it wasn't just casually walking out of the grove, walking over and across the street. It was suspended in air, like he said, about 10 feet and a strange diving motion, just hovering and levitating. Now he said, as it got closer to the road, it began to change and move and landed squarely on its feet, only a mere stone throws away from their car and then would bound off again, just like the movements of a kangaroo forever disappearing into the night. And its arms did remain outstretched as if reaching for something unseen. And it moved in a way that defied all laws of physics and nature. So not only did this leave Edmund and his brother completely terrified, but they couldn't explain it because it was so bizarre and it didn't make any sense. They had already been driving slowly due to the dense fog, but as soon as this figure began to emerge, the brother, Edmund's brother, who had been driving, had slammed on his brakes as soon as this thing came into view. Now, after it vanished, they both exchanged a confused glance with their eyes wide with disbelief, both saying, did we really just see that? But they had. And Edmund continues to state that there was just something otherworldly about this being or entity, whatever you want to call it, and felt that there was something in the atmosphere that he feels set up this sighting. Because as he has mentioned earlier in the story, even about 20 minutes prior to the sighting, he felt that something was wrong, as if his gut intuition would sense that something was going to happen. Now, due to the nature of such a crazy sighting, 
Edmund and his brother would keep this sighting to themselves because it sounds incredulous. But Edmund did confide in an old fisherman friend, a bayou fisherman who didn't scoff at his story. And in fact, his fisherman friend, who he never told me the name of this guy, would tell him about the Rougarou. I hope I'm saying that right, a creature of local folklore to New Orleans. Actually, the Rougarou has a lot of history steeped in French folklore, but that's for another video. Now, he's not sure if this is exactly what it was, although the silhouette and what he did see did match the description. So then Edmund goes on to mention that only a few months later in September, they would have another bizarre experience. Edmund and his brother, who to my knowledge, he never expressed that he was affiliated with any sort of spiritual belief system, but from the way he made it sound as if he had friends or family that were attending or a part of the voodoo gathering in a city, a vibrant spectacle of ritual and tradition, and after the voodoo festival, as he described, they found themselves on that same winding road. Now, apparently, they had been taking this winding road for quite a while, mainly because it got them home faster, and ever since their prior experience, they had decided to start taking it for for some reason, even though I think I would never ride that road again personally if I had an encounter like that. Now, this experience actually happened on a completely different section of that same road. He didn't mention if it was before or after, but he did mention that it was apparently near where there used to be an old cemetery and that him and his brother saw these two or three pulsating orbs just materialize out of nowhere, start twirling around and shoot up into the sky to form what he would describe as this in his words, an artificial sun pulsating and glowing with an eerie red, but it was hovering right above another cane field, probably no more than 100 to 200 feet, defying all logic and physics. It would dart back and forth violently and then shoot upwards at an impossible speed only to vanish and would all of a sudden reappear moments later directly above their car. This had gone on for several minutes. And so Edmund and his brother decide to pull over because they're both thinking like, holy crap, what's going on? They pull over, turn the car off, get out of the car. They're looking up at this spectacle unsure of what to even do. And from the sounds of it, this story took place back in the early 2000s. So they didn't have a camera on them. They didn't have a phone to take pictures. They were just watching what they would describe as some sort of UFO anomaly dancing across the sky in this bright pulsating blood red light. Edmund described it as, as, as if it were performing a celestial ballet for an audience of two were his words. It was mesmerizing, but at the same time, extremely unsettling. It was as if the laws of nature were being completely rewritten before their very eyes. The light then split into two, then three, then five, then ten, each orb moving independently, their movements synchronized in a strange otherworldly dance. And they sat there for a few more minutes watching this happen before the lights just seemed to dematerialize. Now, here's also where the story gets really interesting. Of course, after this, the brothers get back in the car, they drive home, and not even an hour later, both Edmund and his brother start to experience strange symptoms, pounding headaches. They're both bleeding out their eyes, their noses, and their mouths. They go to the hospital. The doctors can't find anything wrong with them. And both brothers would later on in the next I want to say day or two from his description would have these strange burn marks appear on their skin, kind of like an extreme sunburn, but far more excruciating. And within three to four, five or so days, all the symptoms clear up and nothing ever happened. Now, Edmund would later relate to me that probably about two or three years later, his brother would develop a sudden and aggressive form of cancer, which unfortunately took his life within about eight weeks time. He has no idea if the events of this story and his passing are related in any way. He doesn't think so, and neither do I, but because people do get rare aggressive forms of cancer, but it's definitely strange because that's not the only story that I've personally heard where people will see or experience things that are akin to radiation sickness only to later on develop strange, aggressive forms of cancer in which they're dead in a short amount of time or they stumble upon information they shouldn't be knowing or hearing and the same thing, they're opted out pretty quickly. Not that I'm saying that's what's happened. I'm just mentioning that there are connections and other stories like that that are out there. But as far as the real authenticity of his experience and account on what happened to Edmund, well, I'll leave that up to you guys. What do you guys believe? A terrifying 
what many deem as supernatural string of murders was carried out by a mysterious figure known as the New Orleans Axeman. He struck fear into the hearts of the city and seemed to defy all rational and physical explanations. Desperate to find answers, some even pointed to supernatural forces as the cause of the bloodshed. This story is crazy, and it all began that fateful night on May 22nd, 1918. Brothers Jake and Andrew Maggio were just slipping into a peaceful slumber when they were suddenly alerted by a mysterious moaning coming from the adjacent room, where their brother Joseph and his wife Catherine resided. Concerned and puzzled by the noise, Jake and Andrew tried calling out to Joseph, but there was no response. And with a growing sense of dread, they began to investigate. Upon entering Joseph's apartment, they discovered that the rear door had actually been eerily chiseled apart with the front panel removed and the wood chisel placed atop it, as if taunting them. Now fearing the worst, Jake and Andrew searched the apartment and it was in Joseph's bedroom that they stumbled upon a grisly scene straight out of some dark, disturbing horror Hollywood movies. Now, here on the bed lay a horrific sight. It would forever stay with them. Jake and Andrew found their brother Joseph bloodied and gasping for air amidst the gore-soaked sheets. He was practically drowning in his own blood, crippled by the gruesome gashes that painted his head and face. But it wasn't just Joseph in that horrifying scene. Catherine, Joseph's wife, lay on top of him motionless and drained of blood. The once vibrant couple had been reduced to a living nightmare. As the brothers frantically called the police, Joseph's last moments ticked away. The strength to speak, to even move, escaped him as light began leaving his eyes, trapped beneath his wife's lifeless body. And with each dying breath, the mystery of the bloodshed had just begun. When the authorities arrived, they found a savage description of brutality etched into every inch of the crime scene. Catherine's throat had been so deep that she was close to being decapitated, and her head was desecrated with gory axe wounds. It looked like something straight out of the Chainsaw Massacre. As they scoured the scene, there was a bloody axe and a set of bloody clothes that were discovered, suggesting that the vicious killer had changed into a fresh set before vanishing into the darkness. Now, a straight razor was also found, adding to the dreadful tapestry of terror. Piece by piece, police tried to paint a picture of what unfolded within these bloodstained walls. The killer had apparently chiseled off the door panel and entered the couple's home. And there, within their safe haven, they were viciously attacked. Joseph was struck with an ax while Catherine had her throat slashed, and as they lay beaten and broken, both of their faces and heads were brutally mutilated. But why this couple? What was the motive behind the monstrous act? And as you're about to find out, this isn't just some typical true crime story. There are quite a few supernatural elements to the story, so check this out. Now, as they searched the area near the house, they found a chilling message scrawled in the childish letters across a wall that read, Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. This cryptic note only thickened the mystery, leaving more questions than answers. Robbery didn't seem to be the motive as nothing was stolen and the family's valuables remained untouched. It became increasingly apparent that whoever committed this heinous crime had entered the home with one clear purpose, to kill. But what unsuspecting soul would become the next target in this macabre tale? The investigation was already far from over, and the trails of blood seeped deeper into the city's darkest corners. There were suspects in the chilling case, but one stood out above the rest, the victim's own brother, Andrew. You see, Andrew was a barber by trade, and the gruesome weapon used to nearly decapitate Catherine was a razor that belonged to him. Is anybody else getting Sweeney Todd vibes here? He claimed to have left it at the house to fix a mirror flaw in the blade, but that wasn't the only suspicious detail. Andrew told investigators that he hadn't heard the break-in or the murder even though it happened just next door. He maintained it was because he and his brother Jake were quite intoxicated at the time. 
They had been out celebrating Andrew's last night of freedom before he was set off to ship off and join the Navy to fight in World War I. Now, despite his desperate pleas of innocence, Andrew found himself in cuffs facing the possibility of being convicted for his own sister's murder. But just a few days later, something unexpected would happen. Authorities realized there wasn't actually enough evidence to hold him. And so Andrew was released leaving this horrifying case without any answers for now. There was speculation among the police force as they investigated the brutal murder. Several suspects were brought in for questioning, but none really led to any further arrest. And as they dug deeper into the case, they discovered something truly horrifying. Between 1911 and 1912, there had been a series of chillingly similar murders in various areas of Louisiana and Texas. In total, there were 49 killings, all involving people or entire families who had been brutally murdered with an ax while they slept. In at least one of these horrific cases, a cryptic note was left behind. It read, when he maketh the inquisition for blood, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble, human five. Although there was no concrete evidence linking the Maggio killings with these past cases, one unnerving clue suggested a possible connection. Now, at the scene of the crime, a chilling message in chalk was found, right? Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. Well, the last victim of the 1911 to 1912 killing spree was a man named Tony Skyambra. The police were left with a gnawing suspicion that they were dealing with the beginning of another gruesome spree, and all they could do was wait to see what would happen next. Unfortunately, they wouldn't have to wait very long, because on June 28th of that same year, barely over a month later. The morning sun was up, beautiful and shining on a small grocery store owned by a Polish immigrant by the name Louis Besumer, and he was living his life in the United States and operating a fairly modest business. But that ordinary day took a very dark turn. On what seemed to be a typical morning, a bread delivery man named John Zanka arrived to find the front doors of the Besumer's grocery store blocked. It was odd and unusual, as the store was always open at this time. The curious delivery man, thinking something wasn't quite right, made his way to the back of the store and knocked on the door. Now, it must have been a surreal moment when Lewis, covered in blood, opened the door claiming he and his mistress, Anna Lowe, had just been attacked by an axe-wielding intruder. Now, inside, both Lois and Anna had suffered horrendous blows. Did I just say Lois? Lewis. Lewis Basumer. Lewis had a fractured skull from a hit on his right temple, and Anna had been slashed over her left ear, leaving her unconscious and in a pool of blood. Now, the disturbing scene shared chilling similarities with the Maggio case. The intruder had gained entry by chiseling away a wooden panel of the back door. No items had been stolen from the store, and once again, the axe used in the attack belonged to the victim. Lewis was taken into custody as authorities suspected he might have been the attacker despite his own injuries. Anna was rushed to a hospital for treatment where her statements only deepened the mystery. She initially claimed that a tall, dark-skinned man attacked her, causing the arrest of a 41-year-old black suspect, Louis Ubicon, who worked at the store. However, later she changed her story, accusing Louis of the attack and making bizarre claims that he was not a real grocer, but rather a German spy. These claims fueled sensational news reports and rampant speculation about the case, which itself became notorious due to the scandalous circumstances of Lewis being found with his mistress. Now, despite all the attention, investigators made very little headway. There was no concrete evidence to prove that Lewis was the perpetrator, nor to point anyone else. In time, Anna passed away on August 5th, 1918, due to complications from surgery on her damaged facial nerves. Now, Lewis eventually stood trial for the crime, even serving some time in prison before being acquitted and released. The true identity of the savage attacker remained a mystery. But at this point, who was the real assailant and why did they strike? Now, I understand at this point, you're probably wondering why this sounds like some murder mystery, but I promise you stick with me. We're going to dive into the paranormal part of it. 
because on August 5th, 1918, something extremely bizarre would happen. Now, on that very same day, like we discussed, poor Anna Lowe finally lost her life, and a man named Edward Schneider returned to his home late at work. Expecting to be greeted by his loving pregnant wife, he instead found his house unnaturally silent. I think you guys can probably guess where this is going. After making his way to the bedroom, he discovered his wife lying unconscious, a gruesome mess, and in a pool of her own blood. Her scalp had actually been brutally torn off, and several teeth had been violently knocked out. Now, the police investigated the couple's apartment, but they couldn't find any sign of a forced entry, and nothing had been stolen. When she awoke at the hospital, Mrs. Schneider claimed that her attack was an axe-wielding dark figure resembling some sort of, in her words, phantom. Miraculously, she would later give birth to a very healthy and thriving baby girl. Aww. Despite her harrowing ordeal. But the terror was far from over because this is just the beginning. The police would arrest a man named James Gleason, but with no evidence to hold him, he was released without charges. One part of the community was struck with fear, and they realized that there might be a potential serial killer on the loose as a consistent modus operandi began to emerge. Only five days after the Schneider attack, another horrifying assault took place. In the dead of night, two sisters, Pauling and Mary Bruno, were jolted awake by bone-chilling thumps and bangs coming from their uncle Joseph Romano's room. Venturing into the hallway, their hearts would race as they saw a tall, dark, heavy-set figure dressed in a dark suit and hat lurking ominously. Now, when Pauline screamed, ah, the intruder fled, moving with a nibbleness that surprised the terrified sisters. They rushed to their uncle's room, only to find him lying in a pool of blood, vicious slashes and gashes all across his face. Though he was alive when they got him to the charity hospital, he tragically succumbed to his wounds only two days later. And upon further investigation, police found that, just like in the previous cases, the door had been chiseled open and a bloody axe was discovered in the backyard. Now, with panic now gripping the entire community, this sinister figure would remain at large, and no one could have predicted the terror that was still yet to come. Now, at this point in time, the city of New Orleans was beginning to really feel the grip of panic and hysteria. People were whispering about a madman on the loose, prowling the streets and causing terror, with dread lurking behind every corner. There were quite a few citizens that took to actually barricading themselves inside their homes at night, scared of waking up to a cold glint of an axe coming down upon their heads. Family members even began taking turns keeping a night watch armed and vigilant as their loved ones slept. And soon, newspapers began referring to this horrifying figure as the Axeman. The authorities found themselves flooded with all sorts of tips and alleged sightings across the city. Some seemed more believable than others, with claims ranging from a grocer finding a wooden chisel near his back door to another discovering an axe in his yard. Some sightings bordered on the bazaar, like the one where the axeman was reportedly seen disguised as a woman, though the subsequent police investigation would find nothing. Another witness claimed the menace leaped effortlessly over fences, but a manhunt turned up empty. In one particularly dramatic encounter, a man said he had heard someone chiseling at his back door. He fired his shotgun through the door, seemingly sending the trespasser free fleeing, yet leaving no blood or signs of injury behind. And as more and more people reported mysterious occurrences, such as chiseled doors, axes found in yards, and shadowy figures lurking in the darkness, authorities would scramble to determine which leads were worth pursuing and which were simply the byproduct of mass hysteria and growing panic enveloping in New Orleans. Police were already struggling to identify this attacker, especially because no fingerprints were found at the crime scenes. The victims seem to all have one thing in common. Many were grocers. Another bizarre clue was that in each case, the attacker chiseled away at the doors and left behind the chisel. The weapons of choice were typically taken from the victim's homes, which were almost always axes, and these were left behind at the scenes as well. And so a retired Italian detective named John D'Antonio suggested that these crimes were connected to the 1911 killings in the same area and 
could be the work of a single individual orchestrating everything with a dual personality and uncontrollable urges to kill. I get those sometimes too. You know, when I'm driving and someone's either tailgating you or they're just driving slow. I mean, you guys have been there, right? But after a brief hiatus in the attacks, the Mad Axemen reemerged on March 10th, 1919 in an immigrant suburb known more commonly Gretna. Just across that old layer Mississippi River from New Orleans, here he would target a grocer named Charles Cortemiglia. The attacker, a large man dressed in dark clothing, came bearing an axe. Now, upon hearing the commotion, Charles's wife and their two-year-old daughter, Mary, came running, only to find Charles lying on the floor in a pool of blood. The attacker then turned on the wife and child, and, well, you know what happens. The gruesome scene was then discovered when a neighbor named Lorlando Giordano, what a name, huh? Went to check on the ruckus and found the family in a horrifying state. Though the daughter was killed and both Charles and his wife survived the attack, suffering from severe head and neck injuries and skull fractures. Despite several leads and false alarms, the police were no closer to unmasking the identity of the brutal attacker who was now terrorizing the community. Now, there was a lot of fear and confusion surrounding a particularly gruesome crime scene in New Orleans. Police would discover yet another bloody axe discarded on the back porch and the door had been chiseled away just like in other chilling cases. Fingerprints were nowhere to be found and even stranger, the perpetrator had neatly stacked timbers from the destroyed door by a fence suggesting a plan for a quick escape. To the investigator's surprise, nothing had been stolen, no money, valuables, jewels, gems, or other belongings. Now as soon as the wife, Rosie, was able to speak, she shockingly accused their neighbor Orlando Giordano and his son Frank as their attackers. Now, the claim seemed bizarre considering Giordano was an elderly, unwell man who weighed nearly 300 pounds and could not have possibly fit through the chiseled door opening. The husband, Charles, disagreed with his wife and vouched for their innocence. Nevertheless, the father and son were convicted, with Frank receiving a death sentence and Orlando a life sentence. Now, fortunately, Rosie would retract her statements in 1920, confessing it was a spiteful lie to remove business competitors. Now, why doesn't she get legal action against her? The innocent men were released from prison. Now, this baffling case sent shockwaves throughout New Orleans, with many residents still feeling terrified and baffled. The police would follow numerous strange theories to explain the invasions, because now things weren't making sense. Some even suggested the attacker could be a small, petite person. Now, desperate for answers, the public now created their own rumors, claiming that the fearsome attacker, here we go, guys, you guys ready? They claimed it was not human. People began talking that it was a supernatural phantom, a demon, or entity that can move with lightning speed. A witness even claimed the mysterious figure moved as if he had wings. Now, as the terror grew, some began comparing the Axeman murders to the infamous Jack the Ripper case from years prior. Some wild speculations suggested they were one and the same with the unknown killer still on the loose, preying upon unsuspecting victims. The fear, panic, and uncertainty surrounding the Axeman in New Orleans remains one of the most chilling mysteries. Now, here is the craziest part of this whole story. The twist, I guess you could say. A letter was sent to the editor of the New Orleans Times on Friday, March 14th, 1919, that detailed some pretty horrific and disturbing details. Now, the twist? The letter was from the supposed killer himself. It read this. They have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what your Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axemen. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with the blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their 
investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axemen. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I will feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans again. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain that it is that some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there will be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy. Now what was mentioned in that chilling letter would soon become a reality. The fear of this maniacal force, or perhaps even a demonic presence, would fuel a never-before-seen celebration across the city. Imagine being there as clubs, bars, and residences were filled to the brim with a throng of partygoers desperately playing jazz music at deafening volumes, hoping it would be enough to keep these so-called axeman entity at bay. And as they danced the night away, the air vibrated with the power of music as it was as if their very survival hinged on it. A celebrated local composer by the name of Joseph de Vella sensed the tension and decided to contribute to the survival effort. With his most recent creation, a tune called the Mysterious Axeman's Jazz, don't scare me, Papa, he managed to score a massive hit. And would you believe it? On that fateful night, as the city erupted into a cacophony of jazz and celebration, there were no new attacks, just as the letter had promised. It seemed like whatever ghastly force had cast its dark shadow over the city was satiated by jazz music. But not everybody was rejoicing in the music. There were those who openly defied the axemen with open bravado, leading up their shotguns and daring the menace to step foot in their very homes. And amidst the fear and frenzy, glimmers of hope began to emerge, hope that perhaps this mysterious evil had finally been appeased that they might be finally safe. But as they soon found out, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, there are explanations that have swirled around the identity of the New Orleans Axemen, ranging from the plausible to the utterly bizarre. And over the years, people have tried to make sense of the mysterious case, and the identity of this enigmatic killer seems to always just be out of reach. Many early theories fueled by fear and panic suggested that the Axemen might be exactly what he claimed to be in his chilling letter to the police, a bloodthirsty, supernatural entity or even a demon. It seemed like the only way to explain how he always managed to evade authorities, slipping into homes through impossibly small openings despite his looming figure, and witnesses described him as incredibly light-footed and agile, even seemingly impervious to bullets. Those who had come face to face with the attacker could only recall a large figure dressed in dark clothing with no real discernible features. Could it be some sort of mental power that kept his identity shrouded in mystery? And what about the fact that no fingerprints were ever found, not even traces of them being wiped clean? But let's step away just for a moment from the realm of the paranormal for a look at a more down-to-earth possibility. Considering that the majority of victims were Italian immigrants who owned or operated small businesses, some have theorized that the Axeman was actually a mafia hitman. It's true that New Orleans 
had a significant mob presence at the time, with many using grocers as fronts for their criminal activities, it's not exactly unreasonable to think that the victims could have been caught in the crossfire of a mob war, or perhaps were even directly targeted for some insidious reason. One intriguing detail in support of this theory is the final Axeman victim, Mike Pepitone, whose brother Pete was arrested for the murder of a mafia individual named Paul Discretina. I believe that's how you say it. Now, the killing was to be a retribution for a botched assassination attempt on a mob boss, a man by the name of Vincenzo Morichi. Now, it happened within Peter's own store, another connection to the Axeman's preferred grocer targets. And lastly, one prime suspect frequently connected to mob activity is Leon Frank, or Doc Mumphrey, also known as Joseph Monfrey, seemingly a pharmacist, he had a dark past related to mafia violence involved in a kidnapping in 1907 and the dynamiting of an Italian-owned grocery store in 1908. He was notorious as a blackmailer and extortionist within the Italian community. In 1911, he was sent to prison, and during this period, he was the prime suspect in a suspected mob-related assassination. The validity of Mumphrey's ties to the Axman crimes is uncertain and mirrored in conflicting research. Nevertheless, it's suspicious that similar killings ceased while he was in prison, resumed after his 1918 release, and then stopped altogether upon his move to California and apparent death. Now, among other theories, people have considered the New Orleans Axeman a deranged serial killer, a maniacal midget, a mad woman dressed as a man, a vampire, or even Jack the Ripper himself. Though countless speculations, theories, and debates have arisen, the killer's true identity or what it might be, human or not human, remains unknown. I mean, we may never know the who, the why, the how, or even the number of victims involved in this chilling killing spree. And the New Orleans Axeman case rests as one of the most barbaric, baffling, and perplexing unsolved mysteries in New Orleans history. Despite the city's terror, many questions remain like was this merely a series of mafia hits, a roaming serial killer, a deranged individual succumbing to a temporary bloodlust, vampires even? Perhaps even the act of a murderous supernatural entity. As we know, ladies and gentlemen, the New Orleans Axe Phantom remains a mystery. But I'd love to know your guys' thoughts and opinions on the matter, so please go ahead and smack that big ol' red like and subscribe button for more content just like this. I got some longer form content coming your way, guys, so get excited. I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in a future episode.